Welcome to Bitter Reality Brewing. This is our weekly top 10 tricks, recommendations, tips, hacks, whatever you want to call them, I don't care. Like I said, we have over 100 of them, so this is 11 to 20. Last week we did everything about cleaning, so this week I decided to mix it up. Got a few more on cleaning, just two, and then we'll go into equipment, and we'll go into, I don't know what you call them, hacks, procedures, ways of doing things, tips, I mean, pretty much what they are, or suggestions, things you should be aware of or you should be doing or just be aware of. So number one, and before we get to number one, don't forget subscribe, like, thank you again for all the great support we've been getting. Greatly appreciate it, helps a lot. If anything we mention or equipment we mention, we'll put links down below in case you need to order something like that. You're like, oh man, that, that makes sense. I wish I had that or I should have got that. It's gonna be down below. So number one, this is nasty, but I see it, is every time you replace a keg, you should be at least flushing your lines, cleaning them, uh, at minimum, some star sand. And mentioning star sand, one of our subscribers pointed something out, and I kind of use the words interchangeably, and I shouldn't, but I hear it, and I hear it from other people, especially on YouTube, and even in the forums, Reddit, and we're wrong. Sterilize and sanitize. Star sand, so that's my star sand spray, will sanitize. Sterilization means to kill all microorganisms. Sanitize means to kill or clean or remove the majority or almost all, but not all. So just something to be aware of. I do it all the time and I don't think about it that way, but I guarantee people who are nurses and doctors are probably thinking that way all the time. Sanitize is nice. That's how you wipe things down and sterilize means we sterilize. So back to number one, your hoses. Clean them in between, a little star sand, things like that, that's great. But once they start changing colors or they look a little funky, replace the hose. I promise you, this stuff is not that expensive. I'm using the eight millimeter, which doesn't have as good a flow as some of the larger ones, but that also means I can use a lot less of it. And using a lot less makes it super cheap. I use it with the Durotype system. So replace your hoses from time to time, especially if you've had a keg sitting in there for the majority of the year for some reason, because either nobody liked it or I don't know, whatever your reasons are. Chuck that hose, put some fresh hose in there from time to time. I keep a little bit of everything. I always buy my hoses in whatever the, you know, not the exact measurement. I buy 18 feet, probably minimum, 36 feet, 100 feet. And I get it when it's on sale if I can to save myself some money. But hose is cheap. Yeah, even if it's an air hose and it's looking fun, replace it. I mean, the air is going right into your keg and you're just gonna get bad beer. It's just gross. Just replace it. Number two, clean your faucets. There we go. When you clean your faucets, take them apart. I know, the flow control, the whole thing, take it all apart. You'd be shocked at how many seals are in here. And use the proper tools. Just showed this in the last video. These little things, I love these things. Uh, they're, for some reason, they're a little cheaper with the black mesh, but I like the, I guess, kind of white or light colored. So that way I can see if they're looking a little stained or funky, even though I wash them in between every cleaning. But you can clean your shanks with this. Yes, clean the shanks. And take this apart and clean it and clean it well. All your beer is passing through here. Your beer is sitting in that first pull. If, yeah, just clean it. I'm gonna cut to a video real quick on how to clean one of these. It's a short video. And then we'll come back and we'll go to number three. Yes, this is clean already. But So it's time to clean your faucets. What you're gonna need, of course, is your faucet and know how to take it apart. If it's been a while or it's been sitting for any length of time, uh, running through some PBW, it's gonna break down any organics in it and make it a lot easier to clean. This is just hot water, and then that's my star sand. A little trick with the star sand, add the star sand after you add the water and then just stir it up. That way you don't end up with a pile of foam. So, and then one of the most important things, scrub brushes, and scrub brushes for the right size. It doesn't help if you're doing the pullback ponytail effect in somewhere, you really want the brush to be just a little bit bigger than the hole so that it scrubs it really well. There we go. Okay, so I got it out. He's a little wooden shish kebab stick. But another thing you may want to do, because I had a problem one time, is take a photo of everything you take apart and where you take it apart so you can remember where it goes. I've had that problem where I'm like, okay, I got a part and I don't know where it goes. And it was this actually. And you can see it's got a little bit of yellow in there, mainly from staining. I'll try to get more of that out if I can. And then honestly, I like to soak everything. 
in the star sand for at least a little while. These, I'm gonna just clean off and put them to the side. Another thing, star sand will leave sometimes a little bit of residue. According to them, it's sugar and nutrients. I don't want them on my tap. Just simply put, you don't need nutrients sitting on your faucet. Scrub brushes, get every, I guess you could say orifice. You want this basically so clean that you would eat off of it. So you wanna make sure you clean it and clean it really well. Using the right brushes for the right type of holes, which most of the holes there are pretty big, not a big deal. Same thing with any kind of connector you have on the faucet. The right brush. I would recommend rinsing everything just because like I said, star sand, according to five star chemicals does leave a little bit of residue behind. And it's usually if you do the no rinse and it leaves a little bit of sugar and nutrients, which you don't need on your faucet. Once you're done, put it all back, put it back wherever you're using it or set it aside if it's a spare. This one luckily is a spare. Number three, this one entertains me because I've been hearing it for years. I say years, probably almost three years since I've been in all-in-one brewing using an electric all-in-one. And it's hilarious how many people who said it are now using all-in-one systems. All-in-one is not cheating. It's the easiest way to regulate the temperatures and not take up a lot of space in your house. Not all of us can afford a huge three brew system or can afford the space that something like that takes up. Even the big towers, they take up a lot of space. All-in-ones, when you're done, you put them all in, they, they take about this much space on the ground and about this much space up, maybe a little more if you got something like a grandfather with the external cooler or wherever you're putting your chilling systems. But they're not cheating. They're the easiest way to maintain the temps, especially with your mash and you know, it's just, they're easy. I know, I just said all-in-one. Number four, propane burner. You have to have a propane burner. And maybe you don't have to, but the majority of us need one for two reasons. One, quick and easy way to heat up your sparge water. Number two, you can't trust electricity. Electricity is not reliable. From time to time, something happens. If you've watched some of my videos, it happens. We'll lose electricity for a few minutes to a few hours. I can keep on brewing. I can go on over to that and hopefully I've already finished my mash, but I go on over to that and I don't want to kick my generator on and I can keep on rocking and rolling. The propane burners are huge. They just, I know you're like, but I want all electric so I can get rid of my propane. It's huge. And most of us have grills that are gas. So you have something like that. So you already have the propane. Just keep a little burner. You can get them pretty cheap unless you want something fancy. I'll put the one I use down below and maybe a cheaper alternative because mine was kind of fancy. <laughs> Number five, a Sharpie. I know you're thinking, what? And I already wrote on this bottle and I can write some more on here. But when I used to do a lot of one gallons and anytime you have a glass carboy, glass, I don't know about plastic. I would assume it doesn't come off as easy, but glass six gallon, five gallon, uh, it doesn't matter what size. You can write whatever you want on here. Put it in your fermenter, you let it ferment. I had 12, I think 15 at one time, sitting down there fermenting, trying all kinds of different things. Did a lot of smashes, you know, wrote Chinook, Cascade, Citra, Summit, whatever I was, you know, had going. And when I went to check, I'm like, oh, what's that one? And I look and I could see it. Well, when I'm done, a dry erase will wipe it right off or just a wet sponge, it's got a little bit of a rough side to it, wipes right off. Super easy way to label, you don't have to whip out the tape, you don't have to get fancy, just take a Sharpie and just write right on it. Now, if you're using plastic, you're probably gonna have to use some painter's tape or something like that. Number six, and this one's huge. This is a recommendation, as you can tell, the rest was kind of relating to equipment and cleaning equipment. So, number six, build a relationship with your local homebrew shop. As they depend upon you to stay in business, you will be shocked that someday you'll have a major problem, whether it's an off flavor or something going goofy, and they're gonna be a great source. They're gonna go, oh yeah, we've heard that before. Try this, try that. I, I had a keg, one of these kegs was leaking in. I was trying to figure it out and I knew to use, you know, dishwashing soap to get it to bubble and everything. And I kept checking the connects. I didn't even think about the ring where the actual lid was. And I was like, and, he told, I, and there was, one of those things just wasn't sealing right. Everything was right, it just wasn't lining up right. So they depend upon you. Plus, even if you're ordering specialty things online, 
ask them. A lot of times they only carry what they can fit in their store that sells well, but they can probably get the stuff and maybe even save you a little bit of money since it's probably coming in on their truck and they're not paying extra for the shipping beyond what they're already paying for their freight. Also, if you need some equipment, need supplies, and it's an emergency, like I got, as you can hear down here, big bags of grains, I definitely go local. Why would I ship a 55 pound thing of grain? I mean, the shipping alone would be almost what I pay for it locally. So you'd be shocked. And if your homebrew shop's a little distance or you know not quite there, call them ahead, find out what they got, find out what the prices are. And then it might pay to you know get a lot of stuff at one time than having to drive and pick up a few things. Luckily, mine's only across town, so it's not too bad. Number seven, this is when you're at home or you don't wanna go ask in your brew shop or just don't wanna bother people because I don't like bothering people a lot of times either. Read what everybody else recommends, but take every recommendation with a grain of salt. Reddit homebrew talk forums, awesome, great information, lots of resources there. They're huge resources, but remember, not everyone's nice and not everyone's looking to help you. So take it with a grain of salt and you'll find there's tons of nice people out there willing to share or help or assist in any way they can. Number eight, be creative. I know you're thinking, oh, I just brew what I'm told or I brew what I know. Be creative. I got really creative and started having tons of more enjoyment brewing because I realized that the rules aren't always there to be the rules. Sometimes they're there to, how do you say, be broken. But keep in mind too, if you're gonna break a rule, like don't do this when you're brewing or don't do that, look and see if you can find out why that rule shouldn't be broken. You know, if it says, hey, don't add fat, anything like pecans, coconuts, stuff like that into your brew because that fat will kill the carbonation and the head retention. Yeah, that one I probably should have known. I, I didn't realize that I screwed up a beer early, early on when I was learning to brew. But brew, Brewlosophy is a great example of that. He has gone against the grain so many times and proven a lot of things are just simply unjustified. There, there is no factual evidence out there to say, don't do this. Um, for a long time, don't squeeze the hot bag. I think everybody does that now to some degree. Don't squeeze the grains. I still don't really do that too much. I will knock them around a little bit now. I'm not quite as afraid of them, but it's only because I know when people squeeze tea bags, they get all those nasty tannins. So that's just me though, okay? Buy a pair of fire retardant gloves or some really good silicone pot holders. It's like the little dog always has these pair of these, these little Spider-Man gloves I've used for cooking, things like that. Trust me, when you're dealing with hot stuff, and you're brewing and maybe you've had a few beers and you're not thinking 100%, even though you think you're thinking 100%, you're probably not. You're gonna do something dumb. I do things dumb all the time without any alcohol involved. I went to move my propane burner after I heated the sparge water. Yeah, yeah, that was a big mistake. I catch things that fall that are, you know, we're exposed to heat, another big mistake. So get yourself a pair of fire retardant gloves or heat, however you wanna call them or some silicone, something that you can use to grab things when they are hot and try to think before you grab anything. So moving on to number 10. Number 10. Yep, I had to come up close for number 10. So number 10, brewing with mustard and vinegar. Yeah, kind of clickbait, but not really. I mean, yeah, yeah it is. I didn't have the cleavage to show you and you know make you come look at the video. So I had to let you know this, but I always keep mustard and I keep it in the fridge for a reason, and I keep vinegar. I'm allergic to bleach, so sadly I've used a lot of this one for cleaning and getting stuff off tile. But you need these in your house, especially if you're going to have a chance of burning yourself. I know the gloves help, but sometimes you're not gonna have the gloves because you weren't thinking and you did something dumb. So when I was a teenager, I was had some, uh, what do you call it, dehydration and severe burns, and ended up in the hospital and was sent home and told to bathe in tea and vinegar. The tea was to help with the skin because it was from exposure, and the vinegar was to help reduce the pain and take some of the sting out. So, this is why I'm close. You can kind of see the scars, second and third degree burns, poured boiling oil over myself, and a little old lady had told me about the vinegar. The vinegar is the same trick. It's got the vinegar, or the mustard she told me about, sorry, but it's because it's got the vinegar. And the vinegar is what helps take the sting out. It dries up in about 20 minutes, so you gotta wash, rinse, and repeat until the burn's gone. I coated that with mustard. I'm not a doctor. I'm not suggesting medical expertise in any way. 
If you feel you need to go to a doctor or hospital, go to it. But if you get a little burn and you plan on letting it just sting until you get a giant blister, try the mustard. Try the mustard. I, I can't tell you so many times, even my kids have touched hot burners and you heard their fingers sizzle, put the mustard on it every 20 minutes, rinse it, put it on again. Next day, they might have a little bit of what looks like a callus, but no blisters. This thing, I barely had a tiny blister and it wasn't even a third degree burn area. It was very tiny and it took weeks to heal. Vinegar, if the mustard doesn't cut it. And I recently, about a month ago, month and a half now, went to grab a thing of boiling chili as it fell. And yeah, that was the dumbest thing I could have done, although it probably would have hit my legs otherwise. Both hands, dark red, burned like hell. I put both hands for almost four hours, actually a little more than four hours, in a big old bowl of vinegar and ice. Took a little bit to get used to the ice. It was really freaking cold. And eventually I wrapped my hands in paper towels with vinegar and went to bed like that. Yes, and wrapped it in towels so I wouldn't get to bed smelling like vinegar. Vinegar kind of smells. But it will help take the sting out and keep you from blistering. If it's severe, bad, seek medical attention. If it is agonizing and you need go, go go to a doctor, go to the hospital, go to urgent care, go whatever you need to go. But if it's just a burn that you're going to go, ah, it stings like hell in the morning, I'll have a big blister. Try the mustard. Try the vinegar if you don't have the mustard. It does need to be cold. The vinegar is usually cold by itself, but the mustard I found works amazingly well if it's cold right out of the fridge. I keep usually a big one, but I can't seem to find the big ones lately that I like brand wise because I eat a lot of mustard too in the fridge. It is a lifesaver to me and to my kids when they burn themselves. It just, it helps. Who needs to walk around with a blister for a week? I mean, I would rather wake up the next day and have a little tiny rough spot or something and no blisters. So thanks again for joining us on Bitter Reality Brewing. This is the top 10 this week. Don't forget, like, subscribe, share, and thank you again for all the great support. Much appreciated.